Hi, my name is Jonathan Hopp. This is SundayGoodLessons.com, and we're going to do more attack and defense today. We're going to uh, cover some much more advanced topics with, with attacking and defending. Uh, the middle game is the most difficult part of Go for most people, and I thought that I would try to expand how we talk about attack and defense so that you can use more ideas in your games. So the more ideas you have, the uh, more different ways you can look at the same board position and try to find a really good solution to your problem. The idea here, what we're going to talk about, is ways that we use attacks to gain something other than territory. All right. So yeah, the game, name of the game is Go. It's the surrounding game. The person who wins has more control. You know, has more territory at the end. But the idea here is that we can attack to gain things other than just territory. Then to gain things other than just building a territorial framework or to surround territory. Attacking is actually rather subtle, what you gain from it, all right? So there's lots of horse trading in Go, uh, where you try to make weak groups strong, you try to get rid of your own Aji, you try to destroy your opponent's territory, and these are things that relate to territory, of course, but they're not directly surrounding it. And these sorts of tactics will really bring your Go up really to the Don level. Uh, if you can really master them and get their subtlety and have the reading to back them up, then you'll really go a long way and your middle game will be very, very strong. All right, so let's look at some examples and we'll try to go through each one of them and try to learn how we can use attacking for things other than just directly surrounding territory. All right, so I've got a uh, board position here. And let's just look at the balance of power so far, right? So the middle game, uh, you, I like to, whenever I begin an attack, whenever I try to think about my next move, I always look at the balance of power on the board. All right, so um, that basically means looking at high versus low stones, which way the territorial frameworks are facing, if there are any uh, weak groups, strong groups, Aji, these sorts of things are like a checklist in your mind when you're trying to decide your next move. And it's always, always, always good to get in the habit of constantly checking the board uh, for the overall global position. So what you know, what's happening, and that will determine what we do next. So right now I've got a weak Black's got a weak group at A. It's a light group. All right, he's uh, jumped out at F6 uh, to make sure that his group was uh, light. Overall. Black has a lot of high stones, all right? Black has a lot of influence on the board. While white took some territory at the bottom, the lower left and the lower right, uh, white's F4 stone is developing the bottom pretty decently, but the bottom's not going to turn into that much territory. Uh, white's left has a lot of holes in it, and white's right, upper right has some territory. Black has, uh, the only territory we really can call for black is on the right side of the board, about, I'd say, starting at the S10 line, uh, because white can push in there, so... And then the very, very top edge, but not the center. So what we're looking at from Black's perspective is that Black has a lot invested in the center. All right, so he has a lot less influence right here. These stones, these stones are Black's main actors. All right, these are the ones that are doing the most work in terms of building the center. So from White's perspective, it would be really good to destroy the influence of these stones. So I um, have a really great mental um, experiment for people who have a hard time knowing the balance of power. So whenever you put a stone on the board, you can take out a mental magic marker and put down on the stone the number of jobs it does. So if, for instance, if the stone surrounds territory and links up a weak group to a strong group, then you can put down it has, it has stone work, you know, it has two jobs. All right, and you put the stone down on the board, and if you put another stone on the board next to it or nearby, that makes that stone do its job better, or gives that stone more jobs, then you can increase the number. And then at the end of the game, you would just simply count up all of your stones with the numbers on top of them, and the player with the most points will win. I mean, this is a really good way to try to, to look at go from a different angle, from stone effectiveness to efficiency. So right now, black stones, the triangle mark stones, are the ones you know pulling the most weight, doing the most work. So as far as Black's future gains, because Black needs to have a lot of future gains if he's going to try to come ahead with territory, because he doesn't have that much territory to begin with. So, since that's the case, the idea for White would be to try to play stones to minimize or destroy the effectiveness of the mark stones. So, for example, if you have a stone that does two jobs, and your opponent plays a move that gets rid of one of the jobs, then your stone's worth less points, so it works in reverse. So what White's going to do is White's going to pick a target, then White's going to play moves to attack such that he can reduce the um, 
effectiveness of Black's Mark Stones. How can we do that, though? We move Now we move from theory to actual um, fighting, and this is where, where Go gets pretty interesting. Right? I'll have to, actually, I'll have you think about it. Why don't you pause the video and think about it? Where should White play to reduce the effectiveness of the Mark Stones? All right, so let's uh, take a look at some things. Well, first we have we've already identified that A is the weak group. All right, A is where we're going to um, attack. Um, it's this, it, the stones don't have eye space. It's not clear that they have two eyes. And so, but now how we're going to do it? Well, some of you might have thought, hey, there's a cutting point here, right? So I could just cut, and everything will be great. Um, the problem is, is that this cut, this stone cuts the D5 stone from the C6 stone, and from Black's perspective. Those two stones do not add to the effectiveness of the mark stones. I'll mark them again for you, just in case uh, you need to help visualizing it. Those two stones, um, oops, over here. Uh, those two stones do not help the effectiveness of these stones. Therefore, black does not care about them. The only thing that those stones do is, is cannon fodder. So what black will do is black will Atari, Atari again. So now, basically, D5 is captured. C6 can be captured with one more move, but again, black will instead not care about that and continue to play this move. Now look at the beauty that is Black's territorial framework and how this stone at F10 has increased the effectiveness of all of the surrounding stones. This is a very powerful move, all right? This move really does uh, its job in terms of helping Black expand throughout the rest of the board. If you don't like that loose shape, then be, feel perfectly fine to play something like this or like this. You know, for some people, different strokes for different folks. I always say to use your own move. But if we're going to attack the lower left group, we can't attack it by threatening to capture useless stones. It's not going to work. So what we instead should do is try to attack the whole thing. Don't give black an opportunity to say, okay, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to just get rid of a stone and move on. All right, so we don't want to cut. We want to instead um, try to find the right point. Well, if we do this, let's say we try to peep. Well, again, Blacks doesn't really care about those stones, right? Blacks not going to play something heavy like this. White would go like this, and then this is what White's plan is. But instead, what Black will do is Black will say, "Hey, again, D, D5, C6, not not so much, you know, helping me. I'm just going to ignore you and let you cut." White cuts. Black's per now black is starting to open up uh, holes in white's defenses around this area, right? So now um, white is not looking so good, and he took away just a few stones. Y yes, C6 does help white take territory on the side, but in exchange, black gets to develop the center, so black's not really interested in that. Um, white should instead play a move like this. All right, so you're thinking, what's the difference? All right, what's the difference? It's, it's, it's threatening the, a different kind of cut. Well, F6 is a useful stone, all right? F6 is far more useful than D5 or C6. So if we were to play nothing, and white were to cut, then this is really, like, the whole corner is now white's, and black's useful center stone is now lost most of its liberties, and the balance of power has grossly shifted towards white's favor. We can. This is how you really can tell the effectiveness of stones. Uh, if they're gone... Do they reduce? You know, do they reduce the ability of the other stones to do their job? This is how we can really tell whether a stone's effective or not, and now we can really see that F six uh, loss is great for Black. So there's no way that Black is going to let White punch through him. Um, I'm a big fan of Janice Kim, and in her book she talks about like Go is the game of chicken. That uh, you know that a move is good or that a move has some punch to it. If if you if you uh, perform a little mental experiment, pretend like uh, you, if you play a move, your opponent just ignores you. All right, your opponent doesn't care about what you just did. They're going to play some other big move on the board. Well, what's your threat? If your move doesn't have a threat behind it, if your move uh, does not say, okay, if you ignore me, I will destroy you. I will ruin your territory. I will. Uh, capture your stones. If, if your move has no threat behind it, why should your opponent respond to it? So this move has a threat behind it. So what Black will do is Black is very wary now that he's going to uh, lose his effective stone. So uh, Black connects, and now White threatens to play here. Now Black will probably connect here. Why? Be um, at this point. Um, basically because if he doesn't, then White gains a ton of territory at the same time. Alright, so Black will play here. And now White's plans is clear from this point, all right? Uh, White plays the Kama, 
All right, we saw that the Kema, the L-shaped knight's move, is uh, pretty much the bread and butter of attacking if you were watching my earlier lectures. Uh, black comes out. If black doesn't, again, the threat is for white to cover black like this. All right, so this move, uh, G8, is an attacking move because of the threat behind it. So black will play here. And now don't be tempted to try, I know some of you may want to kill the group, and that's, you know, that's very interesting. Uh, but be forewarned that in trying to kill the group, you may open up some uh, weak points in your own position. All right, Because remember, when we attack our opponent, they either sacrifice their stones or run out with them. If they run out with them, then their stones gain liberties and their stones gain access to the center. In doing so, your nearby positions may become weaker. This is really the ebb and flow of go that some people take a little time to master, but when you do, you get to come really strong. That's why in this case, it's much better if white plays B in exchange for A. And now look at this area. Let's look at this center area, all right, right around here. This white stone at one, uh, it's basically white is safely walking into the center. Not only is white reducing the effectiveness of black's uh, marked stones, I'll mark them for you again. Not only is white reducing the effectiveness of these stones. White's doing so safely. White's doing so that he that the stone he's walking into the Black's territorial framework with is not going to be attacked. And he's doing it incentive because he's attacking um, a group. This is a great way to attack. White's not directly gaining a territorial framework. He's not gaining territory per se. I mean, he is kind of. He's, you know, the, the left side becomes stronger as he attacks. But really, that's not the point. The point is to find a target and to reduce Black's influence in the area safely by taking center using an attack. This is an excellent way to attack, and if you can do this in your games, if you can see this, then you'll really go far. All right, so this is a professional game uh, played by one of my uh, favorite professional players, Luo Xihe, um, and he has a very, very interesting style. And this is another great example of things we can gain from attacking that are, you know, are not necessarily territory. Now, of course, uh, some people may, some people may mm, say that you know you attack, and yes, you can destroy your opponent's territorial framework, and yes, you can do X, Y, or Z, and you gain territory. And that's true, you do gain territory. You do gain territory with, with moves you do, and there's no escaping that. But uh, attacking it takes on a different dimension when you're doing it for different aims other than just taking territory. It actually can be used to secure weaknesses. All right, so, uh, so White uh, played uh, F17 just to try to make a group up in the upper left. Uh, Black took a big point here at R17. And then White played Q12. All right, now, uh, some of you may think that this is a kind of a strange move. Maybe many Q players would play something like this. And to be perfectly blunt with you, in many uh, lower-level games, even for some, maybe some, you know, low-down-level players, this, this sort of thing is okay. Um, it does run the risk of black playing like this, though, and so you don't want to get pushed down. But for, you know, some single-digit Qs, this might be a perfectly legit way to play. But normally, you're supposed to play like this, all right, to try to maximize... Uh, what you gain on the right side of the board. Now there is some there is uh, some problems here, right? So, but in the game, Black played this. All right, Black uh, played at b16. Um, basically, it would have been better if Black had just defended his upper right group. This looks like a slow move, right? Like, why would Black play a move like l17 and just? make a two-space jump from a what seems to be a strong group, right? Why would he play such a slow move? Why would he play defense at this point? If black played this, then white would most likely uh, play at b16 to defend his group. In which case, black, there's some Aja here, and this is the, really the main point of this, of this, of what's happening on this board. All right, this is the hidden conversation. A lot of times when uh, weaker players watch stronger players play, the stronger players seem to be reacting to things that the weaker player does not necessarily see. Like, there, they, there's some hidden agenda that they're working under that's just, you know, it's just below the radar, all right? So that's what a move like L17 is doing, all right? So a move like L17 is basically saying that I need my upper right groups to be strong in order for me to come in 
on the right side. We don't want two weak groups next to each other. So if we're going to make a weak group, we're going to make sure that everything around it is strong so when the weak group goes in, they won't damage anything else uh, while they're coming out. Because remember, when your opponent invades, we either trap them and hold them in on the side, or we take the territory under them and push them out. So here, black plays here. And if white decides that he's going to Hani on the outside, then black has some maneuvers and Sabaki maneuvers. Black will play here. White will extend. If you play anything else, if you've tried Atari him, then black will gladly counter Atari. All right, you just take, and then black will destroy the two stones on the right side, and that's terrible. All right, this is this is terrible for white. So instead, you're going to defend like this. And now we have some bad Aji. All right, so black extends. White has to uh, cover. If you play like this, then obviously black's going to Atari you, and then you could let him have even more space like this. This is very dangerous for white. So it's better to just play like this, and then black will come under here. And now white's got a lot of weaknesses. He's got a weakness here, he's got a weakness here, and black can come under at three and uh, do things there. So it looks like if black gets that initial move at Q11, there's a lot of bad Aji in white's shape. All right, Black has a lot of space, and white's outside shape is not firm, it's not thick. Uh, when black plays here, so this is this basically means since this uh, white shape on the right, I'll mark it for you. This white shape at the right, since it's not thick, since it has a weakness in it, that means the right side of the board is not uh, white's territory. If we look at the overall balance, white does not cannot afford to lose that much territory. I mean, look, let's look at it for a second. Uh, white has territory in the lower left, but only a handful of points. I mean, it's really, really small. He'll get like three or four points there. White has a f uh, pretty good, decent upper left corner. It's a, a one, two, it's a five by three square, about 15 points or so. But then white has this really big, heavy, chunky group right here. All right, this is like heavy luggage. We're trying to run out the airport, and we're trying to make our flight or make the cab, and what do we have? We have a gigantic suitcase filled with everything we brought back from the, from the vacation, and God, is it heavy. All right, so maybe you've had that experience. You can think of white groups at A like that. It doesn't have an eye. It's really big. You cannot let it die. Uh, if you let it die, then black wins the game. So you're going to be spending a lot of moves making this group live. Um, some of you may say, well, it's out in the center, and black isn't directly attacking it yet. That's true, but this group is not in the future is not going to make a lot of points, so we can't think of it that way. If that group is not going to make a lot of points, and that group is going to be a liability on our balance sheet, then what we have to think about is that the right side of the board must become white's territory. There is no other way for white to win this game or move on if the left right side of the board does not become his territory. So at this point, what white is thinking is, okay, well, since that's true, um, if black uh, black were to play here and white plays here uh, in the game, um, black played like this, and he really missed the chance to defend. Defense was actually a good uh, idea here. A lot of times when we talk about attack and defense, we don't talk about the defense part. Let's see what happens when black uh, plays here. All right, uh, white attacks. All right, white takes the vital point. White squeezes M17. Uh, black could just easily defend. That would be a good idea at this point. Um, in defending, white might uh, try and uh, try to move elsewhere on the board. Uh, probably like this. Uh, try to help out the center group. And white is just as easily get rid of that algae with a move like this. All right, but most likely white will play something like this or the the jump out to try to help the uh, lower the center group in the lower part of the board. All right. Um, in the game, black uh, took. A 3-3 point, because basically what he's saying is I'm going to come in around J17, J16, split those two groups apart. But now what White's going to do is White's going to take it, it's going to attack the upper right group to get rid of that bad Aji. So White plays here, takes away the eye space of the black group. Black defends, alright, we attach to make our son stronger. And now White gets this move, alright? This move looks, it's really, it, it's simple, right? Where our, our opponent attaches, we Hane. But in hane now the right side of the board has be, is, become solidified. There's no bad Aji. If there's not really a lot of bad Aji, then that becomes territory. So Black plays here, and then White takes this point. Uh, the White's attack at M17 and S17 did not necessarily gain a lot of territory. But in essence, they did, because now this area 
is become has become White's territory, which White needs in order to maintain the balance, in order to have a shot at winning this game. So we made moves that were not for the express purpose of surrounding territory. They were not for the express purpose of attacking in surrounding territory. They were for defense, a, a defending our group through attacking. All right, this is another uh, subtle technique, and if you can really get it, then you really will become a good go player. All right, uh, let's look a little forward in the game. Black plague here. So what white gained on the right, black he has to, it's kind of loosening in the middle because black's going to attack him. Um, black, if black plays like this, this is just sad. You can go home. Um, all that white gets to defend the top group. All right. So again, this, this is not a perfect thing for white. White still had to pay a price. Uh, even though he had to attack the group, he still did not make a solid uh, upper part. If white had played this. Um, this might have been de actually this might have been decent, but the problem is when Black plays e14, then the uh, White's lower group is really in danger. All right, so that that bottom group is really a shoe and White's uh, no stone and White shoe. Excuse me, <laughs> not a shoe and White stone. All right, so uh, Black could defend there. All right, so that's why a move like this um, is actually uh, overall for the balance of power is very good. It's defensive, it's slow, but do, making this move means that White cannot attack this group to defend his right side. This is where Go gets kind of weird. We we bob right to attack left. We do we defend to attack. It's like we do the opposite of what we want to do, and then we get the result we want. But if you get the reading, you get the idea, then you can really you know step up your game. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you use these concepts in your game. These are not uh, easy concepts. Uh, for most people, and they require a good deal of reading, but if you can add them to your game, you'll be a lot stronger. Alright, thanks for watching, I'll catch you next time.